All right. Happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome back to another Future Focus, where we are living at the intersection of business, technology, and human experience with the goal of keeping you 10 steps ahead. I am looking forward to today's conversation, which I know I say that just about every single episode, but I actually genuinely, this is like one of the highlights of my week. So I'm really looking forward to this. And today's topic is a big one. So you're going to want to listen up uh, probably either you know watch it again, definitely sign up for the Substack and read the Reflections article afterward because we're going to dig into a very hot topic. We're going to be talking about how, how, practically speaking, AI is actually changing work, which depending on the narratives you're hearing, it's all over the map. We're going to dig into the details of that, some of the challenges organizations are facing to implementation because it sounds good on the surface. Hey, let's just throw AI at it. And there's a lot more to it than that. But then also really digging into what does it mean for us as humans to start working alongside these AI agents? And how does that work? And how do we not trip up ourselves up in some of the pitfalls? And so to navigate that, I brought back guest. And by the way, Kian, you probably have the name out of all the guests I've ever had that I love saying the most. So <laughs> Kian Katan Farouche, who is the CEO and founder of Workera. He has been on the show a couple of times and I always enjoy our conversations about AI. And also, by the way, congratulations, you got top voice this year. So big, big accomplishment there. So things have been going well for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me again, Christopher. Always happy to be here. And I heard you got top voice too. So congratulations <laughs> to you as well. I, yes, I did. So thank you. Um, so yeah, so as we get into this though, for folks, you've been on a couple of times, but not everybody, especially since I've changed the branding and the show is reaching a different audience now. There may be folks who actually don't know who you are because they didn't hear the other episodes, which I would highly recommend you go back and check out. But for folks who don't, little bit of the like, trip down memory lane to who Kian is and the journey you've been on because it's been a wild couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Happy to introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm. By the Kian. way, I remember the first time we met, uh -huh. you and I were talking on Zoom. You were in a vineyard in France and that was the very first meeting we had. You were sitting under a tree. I remember it specifically. You were like sitting under a tree. We'd gotten connected by a few things. I'm like, this is the coolest meeting I think I have ever had. In addition to having talking to a person with the coolest name I've ever interacted with. Now, just white background, nothing fun. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now it's white t-shirt. You know, we're, we're, we've reached that level of comfort, That's, <laughs> which, is a, which is a positive. That's good. No, yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit about me for, for, for the audience. I'm Kian. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Workera. Uh, and I am also a lecturer in the computer science department at Stanford University. I co-created with Andrew Wang the deep learning classes. So we teach uh, neural networks. What is a neuron? What is a layer? How do they stack into deep neural networks and so on and their applications? And we've been uh, teaching that for roughly the last seven years. Um, I'm also a founding member of a, a, a company launched by Andrew and called deeplearning.ai that um, uh, was focused on democratizing access to AI education. Those are some of the largest classes on AI out there. Uh, and between the two of us, we, we've taught AI to over 3 million people uh, globally. And um, I'm and curious on that one, as you think about AI education, because this is something that's coming up. I was actually reading some research into this the other day that you know, the need for people to be educated about AI is critical and it's a huge gap right now. So the fact you've taken a 3 million you know, pound dent out of that is, is pretty notable. What level do you go into in some of that education? Because I can see where it's one of those, like there may be people who are like, do I really need to learn about neural networks and deep learning and all of this? Where do you see the average person's knowledge level need, needing to be at least today? Well, I think that everybody will need to be an AI person, okay. uh, but just at different levels of proficiencies. Okay. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have uh, assessments and, 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 and training for uh, the top practitioners that would typically belong to a center of excellence. I would call them the builders of AI. They're the builders okay. because they're the ones who develop language models. They're the ones who develop uh, foundation models. They're the ones who develop infrastructure, who serve these models to users and customers. Yeah. Uh, but that's usually a small percentage of the population. It's maybe 5% of an enterprise. And those would be people who are actually actively working, leading the strategy of AI, building the AI. That's kind of your top layer. They're building, yeah. They're coding, they're, you know, architecting, they're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the top layer. Uh, and their titles may be 
data scientist, machine learning engineer, data engineer, software engineer, things like that. Yeah. And then uh, one level of technicality below, let's say, from an AI perspective, you have a, a group that I call AI plus X. AI plus X are subject matter experts that are trying to acquire AI skills in order to bring it to their domain. So okay. this is very popular, by the way, like the, the, the graduate course in, in computer science uh, we teach at Stanford has two thirds of non-computer science majors taking the class. So, Got it. Uh, you know, mechanical, electrical, uh, material science, uh, aeronautics, aerospace, a lot of students from other departments. And the reason uh, they can do really well with AI skills is because of their subject matter expertise. Okay. Um, and to give you a simple example, which I usually use, we have a group of students in the class who, who come from an energy background, an oil and gas background. And so they understand how drilling works. And they worked on a project uh, to do predictive maintenance to avoid a drill breaking. Because the drill goes down the earth for eight kilometers. And if it breaks down there, you lost millions of dollars of equipment. <laughs> you yeah, you don't just like to send down a magnet and pull it back up. <laughs> exactly. It's lost and the hole is filled. You cannot even dig back into it. Uh, but, you know, they're the only ones technically that can solve that problem because they understand yeah. the sensors on the drill. They understand what materials they're involving uh, the drill with. They understand, you know, the regulations and the people who monitor those machines. So, you know, things that uh, require subject matter expertise paired with AI to solve. That's the second group of proficiency. So would that group then be, and I think these are, when I think of the skill set of who that group would be, because anybody watching and listening is probably trying to figure out, like, where do I sit in that mix? Because mm -hmm. if you're saying everybody needs to be in there somewhere, you're trying to figure that out. So top, you've got like the folks leading all the AI stuff, specifically on AI. That next layer to me seems like, those would be your deep subject matter experts who are really kind of the innovators, the early adopters of a different way of thinking who are going, I want to see how we can improve and change the subject matter expertise that I do, but I want to do it with AI. And that would that be that kind of second tier? That's right. That's right. Okay. Bring AI to your innovations. Okay. Uh, AI, I call them AI plus X. Okay. And I like that. AI plus X. <laughs> yeah. X is, is uh, the subject matter expertise. Sounds fancy too. I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With her. Uh, yeah. And then th there's two other groups that are uh, pure users of AI. Um, and the reason I separate them is you have technical adjacent folks that uh, need to reach AI fluency or gen AI fluency. And those people need AI because it makes them more productive but also because they are interacting with AI people or technical people. Okay. So think about an HR business partner who's supporting a data organization. But if they don't understand what Python is, how are they going to recruit the right people? How are they going to communicate the value prop for the candidates or the work experience? You know, Think about a salesperson who's selling an AI product, a feature. Yep. Uh, think about a marketer who's marketing a data infrastructure product. Those require a certain level of vocabulary, of fluency, of understanding of what is AI, what is not AI, that helps them in their role on top of the fact that it can make them more productive. And we've heard a lot, and there's many studies on showing how productivity is enhanced on many of these uh, desk worker jobs. Um, and then the-, the, the, the Well, and on that one, like I think of that as an example, when I was at GE, you know, when we were, a lot of our products were becoming enhanced with AI. And so even the sales teams, I would say they fell in that kind of third tier where it was, they were interacting with physicians or healthcare technology professionals trying to explain, here's how AI is changing our, and they're getting in a lot of questions about, you know, things that if they had no, con and that was usually a huge upskilling area because people were like, I don't know much about this. And they're getting lots of questions from a CIO or a chief medical officer on some of this stuff. You know, how is AI changing the image resonance of this scan? And if you don't know enough about it, <laughs> you're a little like a, a deer in headlights. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. And then, you know, la last group is the literacy level, which is everyone. And the reason is not as much productivity or innovation as much as it is change management. It's just you want to build a workforce that is going to be nimble, agile, uh, that is going to be bought into the technology direction of the company. And so it's important to not leave anyone behind and to give them the right AI skills to participate in the transformation. So that's what we're seeing out there. Okay. Okay. So either way, and I think I, I see this as you know, in some ways, AI is in part becoming kind of the oxygen of an organization, or it's at least a you know substance that is just embedded into it. So it makes sense that then you're kind of focusing across the board. 
Yeah, but then on that note, actually, so yeah, we, we see two different type of organizations when it relates to AI. Okay, one are the ones that do it well, and they they embed AI in the fabric of the organization, just as you okay. said, which yeah. which doesn't mean just treating AI as a feature, which many organizations do. It means okay. feeling AI not only into their workforce uh, things, but also into their products and into the foundational layers of their architectures. And that is fundamentally different than treating AI as a feature where yeah. you can build a feature called ChatGPT and then market it and then sell it, which does not make a company an AI company. No. Yeah. What's, what's interesting about that, because that actually transitions to one of the first points I wanted to talk about, which is how is AI actually changing merge? But what is interesting about that is this feels very similar as the technology age was picking up where you heard a similar trend where, you know, it was saying every company needs to be a digital company. Mm -hmm. And you saw the same pattern. There were companies that saw the technology integration into its products, into its the way it did work. It's all this, it just became seamless to it, but they didn't have this idea of we are a digital company in the sense of it's a thing we go get or we add on to. It was just a new way of doing things versus the ones that were like, yeah, let's do the digital thing. And I saw all sorts of crazy things. And I think that's what you're getting at with the AI risk is that organizations can kind of find themselves in two camps of this, where they can yeah. be chasing AI for the sake of AI, or they can be saying, this is what our business does this is how our workforce works. Where does AI fit into that mix? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Andrew Ang, uh, told uh, uh, me uh, a good analogy that I'd like to use here is in, when the internet arrived, um, having an internet website, a website does not make a company an internet company. You know? <laughs> right. In the same way, having an AI feature does not make a company an AI company. It turns out that internet companies have certain um, attributes that other companies didn't have at the time. For example, internet companies were really good at using SEO in order to get to get seen. They were really expert at that. They were really good at A-B testing. So most of the pages will undergo some sort of A-B testing to maximize conversion rates. These techniques that are deeply embedded in the culture of the company, in the way they operate, that's what makes the company an AI, an AI company or an internet company, not the fact yeah. that they have a website or an AI feature. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting about that is I'm, I see this as a risk, and this is where we'll talk about how AI is starting to change work, but I can't remember who it was I had had on the show a few years ago, or not a few, a few months ago, and we talked about the fact one of the challenges with big disruptive changes is we tend to just try and bolt on this new thing to the, what we're already doing is this almost separate entity. And I see some of this happening with organizations now where they're going, hey, we're going to integrate, we're going to turn on Gemini, or we're going to turn on Copilot. And now we're an AI company because we now have a large language model internal to our organization. So naturally, that's just going to fix everything. And I think what you're getting at is that's not the secret sauce. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And maybe one data point on that front is, um, so I was in Davos in January, where the World Economic Forum was, and um, I had a dinner with a, a dozen of chief data officers and chief AI officers of large corporate large corporations. And the the probably the number one topic on people's minds was, we are struggling to move from prototyping AI to productizing AI. Yes. So you know how last year there were lots of marketing launches on we're going to launch this feature. Turns out a lot of companies struggle to productize ultimately and to build that data flywheel. When you look at it from a skills perspective, it turns out that prototyping AI requires about a thousand skills to master. Productizing AI requires about tenfold as much. You know, when you count all the skills necessary to productize AI, monitor AI, have the right metrics in place, have the right, you know, responsible AI practices. That's about 10,000 skills. So no wonder companies have an yeah. easier time prototyping AI than productizing AI. And they're on a journey to acquire those 10,000 skills across the organization so that they can reliably and, and responsibly uh, operationalize AI. Well, and I think that's some of the concerns I have with how fast, because what you just described when we think about the skills required to successfully do this kind of a thing, I mean, you've been around the skills space long enough to know skills are not something that you build in an organization 
you know, in a snap. I mean, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes effort, it takes a lot of change management to do that kind of stuff. And so if you're saying successfully doing this is tenfold, you know, a thousand or 10,000 different skills, you're talking about a lot of change to an organization to get this right. And with as fast as things are moving, it can be easy to go. So how do we just short step some of this stuff? And it doesn't work that way. I mean, there's certain efficiency gains you can get, but my experience has been, there's no easy button to do this. No playbook that you just roll out and call it good. Yeah, there is no easy way, but there is a few steps to go through, I would say. Um, The first one is to have a good skills vision. You know, have a really good skills vision. What are the skills that we care about in the future? AI is typically one of them, usually the first one that comes up, but there's also adjacent skills uh, that are durable, meaning companies believe that they will be useful for the long run, at least five years of half-life of skills. Um, And uh, when you have that skills vision that is really well-defined, what I mean really well-defined, I mean maybe it's embedded in the job architecture of the company, in the job families of the company. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Was that you or me? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I heard you. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Well, we're back. We're uh, back. <laughs> no, I was saying. So you're uh, talking about the job architecture, and maybe yeah. people watching. Uh, you let me know. But where I where I lost you was you were talking about really integrating it even into the job architecture and the roles. That's right. That's right. In the job architecture, because you need to set a flag on what are the skills of the future that we're going to care about in you know for our roadmap for our projects for our future innovations and that's going to be an ever changing document but uh but you need to set to set a, a direction for the company yeah and then um the way typically i see that done and then you can start executing afterwards and the execution yeah. usually starts with hey, we have a diverse workforce from different backgrounds and different proficiencies. We have to start by assessing people to know what is their baseline? Where are they starting? Because you're not going to find a one-size-fits-all solution to work for something like AI that touches such a broad population. You, you want to understand the skills of your folks. You want to then put them on the right path and then match them with the relevant projects that align with their skill sets and that are meaningful for the company. And so the the way um, I recommend doing it for the skills vision is three levels. The executive level is durable skills. It's like you're an executive, you want to invest in AI fluency and you define what AI fluency, digital fluency means for you. And you set um, a certain skills taxonomy against that. That's going to make it to the skills requirement of your employees. But it's not the only thing that will make it. Your manager's levels are more aware of the projects that are on the roadmap. What yeah. you're going they know the details. Work. They know yeah, the ins and outs of this stuff. So they're going to add a set of skills to a requirement for an employee that are more perishable, meaning those skills may not be as durable as long-term, but they are perishable, which is what makes them innovative because innovation requires perishable skills, right? Yeah. And so the employee will end up getting a skill requirement in the form of a T-shape. So you have a horizontal bar of the T representing the breadth of skills that are durable that they need to have for the future, including AI fluency, AI literacy, gen AI fluency, things like that. And then the manager would have added the vertical bar of the T that may have uh, uh, required them to know how to sell a data product or know how to market a data product or know how to build a certain type of AI algorithm, which is their depth. And on top of that, the employee may be able to self-add certain skills requirement to their own career by saying, this is something I'm passionate about and this is something I want to invest more in. And that's all together, those three levels, executive, manager, employee, makes up for the skill requirement of an employee that they can verify their skills against and then get access to the right opportunity and the right uh, training. Yeah. And where would you say, I I know what my observation has been on this, because what you described makes sense and it actually fits and pairs nicely with what you described in the different tiers of AI literacy mm-hmm. and how that fits into play. Because as you think about the different roles, you can quickly start to see how they start translating over and going, okay, well, based on that taxonomy in an organization, this is the AI literacy levels people are going to need to be at to be effective in the organization. Where do you see organizations at right now? Because I think this is one of the, you know, we talked about how important it is to understand what the skills are for the future. And my observations have been, this is a huge opportunity area for a lot of organizations to not just think about what are we missing today? 
but what are people going to need to be doing as you know, like we get to it, as AI agents start coming into things, as we start automating some of this stuff, what is it we want people to be doing in that future state and what skills are required? My observations have been, we've got some real work to do to get there. Yeah, I would say, I would tell you where I think companies are from a strategy perspective and then from an okay. execution perspective. From a, from a strategy perspective, I think about a third of organizations have defined their skills vision. And so they're okay. ready to execute against that skills vision. And it's defined at the top. So CEO level definition. Okay. Um, however, when we look at uh, what's happening uh, in the workforce, we see incredible differences between tech and non-tech companies. So okay. um, if you take a, a random uh, sample of 100 uh, workers in tech and you benchmark them in Gen AI, Gen AI is one of the most popular assessments on Workera, uh, you will find that uh, typically over 90 of them will have proficiency. So they will be they would be completely fluent, accomplished in generative AI. That's Which makes sense when you think about how good it is at helping and how disruptive it's been to that industry. Oh, so it makes sure. sense. They've kind of had to adjust. It's kind of like it's, COVID, no. where COVID hit and everybody had to learn how to work remotely. The tech sector, Gen AI came onto the stage and it was kind of like, well, you better figure out how to use this and be proficient at it. Because there's no really other options. For sure, for sure. Yeah, that that played a big role. But I think what played an even bigger role in sustaining, because they kept hiring and sh sh flipping the team, and what allowed them to sustain around those numbers is that in in a company where AI is everywhere and everybody talks about it, it is the norm to know AI. If you don't okay. know it, you're an outlier. Okay. Which is different. So there's some what, social pressure in the exactly. tech companies. Like, there's social like pressure you. saying yeah. you got to be Imagine you, you're in a team and everybody speaks English and you don't speak English. You you stand out. You you stand out. So the, what I'm saying is not knowing AI is the standout rather than knowing AI. And that makes them different from non-tech counterparts where okay. the number is 28. On average, it's 28 accomplished individuals in Gen AI across a non-technical sample of 100 people on average. Um, okay, so and, 28 per, I was like 28 in the whole company. That's no, 28%. No, 28 percent. So 28 yeah. out of 100. Okay. Yeah, 28 out of out of 100 would compared would to 90 though. Time. You said right, 90 in the tech. 90 plus in the okay. tech, and you know the difference is uh, being an outlier in those organizations is knowing AI. So people know you because you're the 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 person who is proficient at it. While it's a completely different targeting that that than than tech. Typically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that, that does speak to some of the opportunities and the disparity between it. And I would say I'm actually, you know, first of all, one, I'm encouraged to hear that from your vantage point, you're seeing that at least at the highest level, I think there's a difference between like the executives have a vision for where things are going and then what that actually looks like when it comes to the execution and translates to that. But the fact that we're up to about a third you know, who at least have an idea of where they're heading is a good start um, with some of that stuff. It is interesting to hear that disparity though. And I would say, I see that firsthand when I interact with people from different industries. You can definitely tell different industries that you're working with. And it is much more apparent whether you're, like you said, an outlier because, oh, you know something about AI and healthcare, that's rare versus, oh, you work in tech and you know something about AI, that's just expected. That's right. Okay, okay. So as you think about some of these things and as you're looking at these skills, I'm actually really curious because now you're doing a lot of this work on what skills are changing, which drives back to this question of how is AI changing work? And we talked backstage a little bit about the fact that, you know, depending on what you read, you'll hear everything from, by 2030, nobody's going to do any work because AI is going to do it all to kind of a complete dismissal of the fact that this isn't going to really do much of anything and we'll be fine. Not only where do you sit on that spectrum, but where are you starting to see? And there might be some nuance based on industries, but where are you starting to see this actually change the way organizations are operating? Yeah. Um, the first thing I'd say is, AI is compressing the half-life of skill to a level that we've never seen before. I so agree with for that. The, yeah, for, <laughs> for, the, for the audience, maybe, because some people may have heard that, that metric, some others may not. 
the half-life of skill is a metric that is shared uh, uh, on a regular basis by the World Economic Forum and a few other companies um, uh, on how long is a skill expected to be useful in someone's career. And 40 years ago, the half-life of skill was above 10 years. So you did not need to refresh your skills very often. Today, it's estimated to be about 4.2 years. And in digital areas, including AI, it's around two and a half years. So every two and a half years, you need to refresh your skills or you're outdated. The phenomenon is that because of the technological advancements, including AI, uh, the half-life of skill is being compressed and compressed and compressed, which yeah. means that from an organizational perspective, uh, the real trend behind AI is skills-based organization. What we're saying is that uh, what's going to defend a company or someone in their career is not anymore the data sets or the algorithm. Being the subject matter expert and knowing yeah. all the things. It is It is uh, the learning velocity. It is the, the speed at which an organization can learn is the new competitive advantage for companies. And we're seeing that across pretty much every industry where the, the competitive modes are changing. Um, okay. Yeah. So What's that, funny about that is when I think about the implications of this, you know, to the senior leaders who listen to this, this is a big shift. Um, I mean, this has big implications, not only on even just organizational dynamics, but also on individual dynamics, because even going back to, I think how companies have often really looked at their competitive differentiator, a lot of it had to do with like their competitive IP or, you know, the way that they did things. And as we think about your ability, your learning agility, your ability to adapt, that's actually, it's not that it's irrelevant, but it's actually diminishing and looking at that as your competitive advantage can actually be extremely dangerous to you because you can become complacent in that. And that actually opens you up to being vulnerable to somebody who goes, yeah, you might do it that way, but that's how we did it five years ago. And actually we are evolving and adapting. So we're actually going to disrupt you. So even the way as a senior leader, you think about structuring your strategies, and where you invest your time and energy is actually dynamically shifting because of that. For sure. And I think about on the individual level, again, this is a shift for professionals out there who are looking at how do I stay competitive? To your point, it's no longer, well, I just know the thing and have been doing the thing the best for the longest period of time. It's I mean, and, and many people have invested in that is how I stay competitive. So if you even think about, I, I'm big into fitness. You think about the kind of workout you do to train yourself for an Ironman versus a marathon versus, it's a different dynamic thing when you go, okay, now the way I differentiate and succeed as a professional is the rules have been changing significantly. And I think that's part of a lot of the disruption that we're seeing that have people so unsettled right now. The things they've been doing forever going, well, this used to work. I mean, based on what you just described, it's like, well, that's not going to work anymore. Yeah. I, I mean, I think to future proof as an individual, I think, am I a T-shaped skilled individual? Can I demonstrate that T-shape? Can I, can I verify that I have the durable skills that are going to be useful long-term in my career? the perishable skills that are going to help me in the next year or so. And then on top of that T-shape, do I have high learning velocity? Have I been able to create um, a learning habits? Uh, am I learning frequently enough? Can I reflect on it on a regular basis? I think those are the things that future-proof careers nowadays. Okay. okay. Well, and as I think about the T-shape, because I think this is one of the debates that I'll engage with every once in a while. I actually think it can even be a little bit misleading to think that certain durable skills, durable means that they don't have to change at all. Mm -hmm. You know, that somehow if you're good at communication, that's just durable. So you, you can just sit and be durable with that. It's like really even the color of the T is changing where it's like, well, yes, there's a durable layer, but the color of that durable layer is changing because the way you communicate or the way you influence or the way you do things, there might be sustainable principles that stick with that but the way you execute and demonstrate those things is shifting. So it's, it's, it's moving very quickly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, communication is a great one. Like you've seen since the, the launch of uh, GPT-3, um, there has been a new expectation for business executives. Those who are uh, uh, giving talks uh, uh, um, on a quarterly basis or doing earning calls, like the new expectation is that the 
the executive has a new communication style that involves an understanding of AI that, 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 that has a new level of mindful communication. So even the role of an executive, which you could say relies on really durable skills that are allowing them to, uh, uh, to communicate effectively, story tell, set a strategy, those are changing as well. They're, they're not changing as fast as the latest AI algorithm, but they're changing. Yeah. So. Well, and I think about as an example of that, practically speaking, you know, and how AI is playing a role in this, in that, you, let's use your quarterly earnings call example as an example of this. You know, in the past, the role was you just needed kind of that senior most person to deliver that information and, you know, give people that from those senior most person. But the reality is like an AI agent could actually just deliver the message now and probably deliver it more effectively, more accurately type of a thing if it's just going point by point versus the role is shifting now to, you know, how are you telling the stories? How are you building trust? How are you addressing some of the concerns that you know are happening, which is on a more dynamic level that in some ways humanizing it where before that wasn't necessarily as important because that wasn't the purpose. We're now if people just want the facts on what your quarterly earnings report is, they're just going to ask GPT-40, you know, give me the breakdown of what so-and-so's quarterly earnings report is. What are the details of this and that? And so it actually is, even within those things, dynamically shifting, which is unsettling, I think, for a lot of people who have been doing what they've been doing for a relatively long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about some of these challenges that are coming and how... so. With this, I'm actually just curious, just to off the cuff, based on how deep you are in some of this AI stuff, what's your take on the impact to jobs of the future? You know, how do you see AI coming into this? Because that's one of the big questions that's on a lot of people's minds right now. Yeah, uh, maybe two horizons: uh, next ten years, and then uh, and then long term horizon. Okay. Uh, talking about AGI, which is more philosophical. But uh, next ten years, I think the um, the what I look at is productivity enhancements. What okay. is the productivity enhancements we're seeing in the workforce right now? Because productivity enhancements turn into uh, different levels of job demand in the future. So if a job turns out is 2x productive, thanks to AI, then you can expect that the demand for that job in the future will decrease. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an early indicator, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and then when we look at jobs, we break them down into tasks, because that's where you can see the productivity improvements. And when we look at tasks, um, we see three levels of productivity enhancement. The 1 to 2x uh, level, which is you know incremental gain. The 2 to 10x, which is augmentation, meaning the task is likely to be a collaboration between a human and an AI. Okay. Um, and then beyond 10x is fully delica dedicated, uh, delegated to uh, a computer or AI system. It is okay. automation. And so when you look at a job and you analyze the 55 tasks that it has, and you see that a significant portion of it is automated, uh, that job is probably going away. Um, okay. And that's probably about a third of the jobs, according to data from OECD and, and, and OpenAI. Okay. It's, it's probably a third of the jobs that are likely gone in the next uh, five to 10 years. Um, yeah. And then you have another third, which are merged or uh, redefined because they have some portion of it that have uh, productivity enhancements at the task level and some portion of the job that is uh, not uh, changed that much. And then uh, that's probably another third. And the last third is jobs that are relatively unchanged. They're not going to change as much. They're going to see incremental gain. But all in all, uh, we're also seeing more job creations. And I am really bullish on um, a job creation. I think there's going to be plenty of jobs to be um, uh, to be taken in the coming years. Um, I think regulations will be one of the main drivers of jobs. The same okay. way in the past, GDPR in Europe has driven an estimated half a million jobs. I think AI regulations are going to push people to take jobs that uh, that require them to measure LLMs, to benchmark LLMs, to okay. uh, deploy responsibly, to make sure that it's fair and it's transparent and it's safe. And those are all specialties that you don't find as much in the workforce today. There's small pockets of research labs that work on, on these problems, but it is a big enough problem for companies to bring it in-house and create jobs against it. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. 
And then longer term, if you think about, you know, what do we do if AGI is here? And um, uh, my view is there's probably two scenarios that are going to complement each other. Okay. Um, one is we, 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 we may actually move toward an experience economy where uh, people live for the experience and they like yeah. to experience new things. And, um, and so there's a huge emphasis on how you experience life. And AI is, is doing a lot of the hard work around to, to make progress happen. Uh, the second uh, attribute is probably maybe we will all become researchers. And what I mean by that is um, I use a circle analogy where imagine that um, all the content in the world, everything we've produced, text, video, images, sure. blah, 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 is contained in a circle. In the middle of the circle, you have things like uh, a math course uh, in English, and you also have a book in Japanese. AI is really good at extrapolating within the circle, learning yeah. in the circle and extrapolating. So AI will be yeah. good at teaching math in Japanese because it learned math in English and it learned Japanese and it can teach math in Japanese. What AI is not going to be as good is to grow the circle, to be working at the frontier yeah. of the circle, where I think there's an opportunity for actually us uh, to innovate. And I would love to see a workforce where AI can take care of a lot of what's inside the circle and people can focus on the frontier. And that's why I say maybe everybody will be a researcher. The frontier is like quantum physics, is like chemistry. It's like AI and cloud and uh, cybersecurity. Are, these things are on the circle. And I think we should put as much uh, effort as possible on, on, on making sure people can uh, grow the circle. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have some similar views. What's interesting, I'll, I'll hit on this one first, is I like your point about the circle. Um, and I, I use an analogy of a box, but I think it's one of those AI gets really good at doing what's within the box or the circle. And I think we're just going to see more and more of that diminish the value of a person doing it is just not going to be there. I think there will always be that portion that is because I even think back to certain things today that it's cheaper to go buy furniture from Ikea, but people still want to go to the custom handmade furniture store of the guy or girl who's specialized in handcrafting. And you're like, why? I think it goes back to that experiential piece. People want something that they feel matters or whatever. And so I think there's even within that circle, there's always going to be that portion of things that it's like, well, it's going to exist because it's just how people are and they're going to want that. But I think being competitive in that circle is going to become harder and harder and harder. You know, you're really going to have to be able to differentiate or find your competitive edge or figure out what unique nuance you bring to it. And so kind of the idea that, well, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and people will love it. I think that's going to be a hard message for some people who go, well, but I just thought I was the best at that thing. And it's like, well, no, you weren't, <laughs> you know, you weren't. And I think your point about, but what's outside the circular box, I think that's the exciting part of where will we be able to expand it? And that's where... You know, I, I commented on this a couple of weeks back, you know, Larry Summers came out and said, AI, there won't be any need for humans to do anything in the next five to seven years or something like that. And I thought, I think we're just more creative and innovative at creating a bigger circle or a bigger box than that. Um, the part that I think that is interesting to your point, though, about the third of the jobs that will be obsoleted is I'm actually really curious to see how that plays out. Because I was having a conversation yesterday about this, and we as people are really resistant to change. And I think this will get into our conversation about kind of the challenges to implementation. How well these things get adopted is largely dependent on people's adoption and acceptance of some of this stuff. And I see people being really resistant to some of this, which may not prevent it. But I think it's going to slow it down to some of the predictions we see. We're like, in theory, yes, could it obsolete things? Like I watched the Google Project Astra launch where they kind of talked through all some of the stuff it did. And I looked at some of those things and I went, yeah, I know people whose jobs are doing that stuff that it can do and probably 10 times better, 100 times better than the people doing it. Yet I know how many people would go, yeah, but I don't want an AI bot to do that for me. I want so-and-so to do it for me. And I don't really care. So it's going to be interesting to watch how that plays out. The other thing that I have some concerns about that I'm actually curious your take on 
is, and I wrote a post about it that I'm going to post about tomorrow. I'm actually a little bit concerned that the rugged individualism that AI is creating is actually going to have a negative impact on organizational performance because cross-functional collaboration is actually key team the way a team plays together is actually t key to a team's success. And the same is true in organizations. And as AI comes in and you get these people who go, well, I don't need to collaborate anymore because I've got Janice, my AI agent, that's going to do everything for me. We run this risk of people just going hyper-individualized, which might be good if you're a solopreneur or something like that. But if you're in a company of 10,000 people trying to work across functional lines and contextualize all this stuff, I see some real challenges ahead of us. I'd say to me, it depends on the, the task at hand, uh, the jobs to be done, because I find that in certain jobs or tasks, uh, you actually want to remove as much of the communication line to get True. more work done. And, you know, we're, we're, we're a remote company. And one of the things that we try to do for our engineers is to um, uh, you know, hire the ones that have the skill to do the full stack of things that we need them to do. Because it's true that when you have two brains doing a single thing, there is a time spent communicating and it can slow down the project. I remember uh, back in the days we had a machine learning project where um, you had a data engineer. It was not at work era, but it was before. But the, you had a data engineer that knew how to query data and you had a, a machine learning engineer that knew how to train models. And turns out the machine learning engineer sees that uh, the model is is uh, failing. Like there's something wrong about the model for some reason. On on the teenager population, the recommendations are poor. They're just bad. And the thing you do in that scenario as a machine learning engineer is you want to get more data that is representative of that population so that you can train your model on it and get them to be uh, doing better recommendation. But the fact that the data engineer owned the querying and the cleaning made it so that you had to wait two days every time yep. to put back. So communication line is actually what you want to remove in that case. But then there's another series of tasks that are maybe more creative that require uh, communication and collaboration because the ideas come out of it. Um, and that's where I think if you if you actually end up uh, siloing everyone, you're going to run into issues from a creative perspective for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think even on the, you know, I, I have an example that very much comes to mind because it happened today where I think about things where, you know, duplicative work happens in organizations all the time. And sometimes it's that collaboration that identifies duplicative work where you didn't realize, Hey, these two people were working on the exact same project or these two teams were working on, wildly similar things. And by coming together, you actually go, Hey, you know what? We should divide and conquer. And that's, that's where sometimes I get concerned about this, where I see things and I go, you know, yeah, it's a heck of a lot easier. We'd be able to get this project done if we didn't collaborate with the change management team, because they're always asking these obnoxious questions like what's your timeline and when are you doing this? Cause there's 30 other things and, and they just slow us down so let's just go through and do this in isolation and then we can just charge forward. And I've seen firsthand the rework and the failures that happen when sometimes this happens. And again, I think it goes back to the durable skills of organizations needing to go as we start integrating AI into the fabric, how do we mitigate or address some of these risks so we don't end up creating a giant mess for ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think it goes back to understanding some of the deeper work. I think a lot of work happens in an organization that is not clearly defined and we just don't know what is actually going into it. Yeah. So I'm also curious then what other challenges, you know, as you look at this as, you know, we talked in the beginning about there's the two organizations, the one that's just looking to kind of like bolt AI on and go, "Hey, we're an AI company." And it's like, "Well, not really." Then there's the other ones that are saying we want to integrate it into the fabric, the DNA of our organization. From a strategic standpoint, that can sound great, but from an execution standpoint, anybody who studied the metrics around how many strategies break down an execution, it's startling. What are some of those things that organizations typically run into where they go, we've got this great vision, we know where we want to go, and boom, they hit a wall, trip over their own shoelaces and face plant. Well, I, I give you a few challenges. One is um, 
One is, uh, you know, the fact that AI is a horizontal skill that everybody needs to learn is a challenge on its own. Uh, That's um, fair. <laughs> yeah, because if you compare to, you, you mentioned digital transformation earlier. There was another set of transformation, cloud transformations. Yep. Cloud is a verticalized skill, so you don't need everybody to know cloud if you are going to transform toward the cloud. But if you're going to become an AI company or to adopt AI, you need everybody to know a certain level of AI. So that's a challenge on its own. The second one is um, we see um, oh, <laughs> balloon. I don't worry, don't worry about. I love the AI, the AR reactions coming from uh, that. You know, we'll, uh, we'll we'll use them. That's how you'll know that we're having a great conversation because I'll throw some into the mix and we'll just let people know uh, what's happening. I like it. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Um, so sometimes leaders are going to have a really good vision for skills and a strategy, but they're not going to have uh, the right level of communication or create the right level of trust within their organization. So for one example is leaders pretending they know AI when they actually don't know, and you end up with a lot of uh, people in the workforce pretending as well, because people tend to yeah. do what the leader is going to do. So if, if they're pretending, why are you not pretending? On the other hand, you have leaders that are part of the transformation. So, you know, on Workera, they would take a skill assessment and say, here is my baseline, and this is my goal for the end of the year, and we're all in this together, and this is what I'm going to do. These are the trainings that I'm going to do on, on Coursera or Udemy or another provider. And, um, and that makes it uh, real for the workforce, which in turn is going to mimic that behavior of learning. And so that's one of the pitfalls we're seeing. We, 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 call, uh, we call that, and that's from one of my friends uh, who calls it dangerous amateurs, is if you pretend you're going to end up with a workforce of dangerous amateurs. I mean, it's kind of like an AI imposter syndrome, which is happening all over the map right now, where there's a little bit of like, I, I can say the lingo because I've read enough articles or seen enough social media posts, but I don't actually really understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, well, you have to create a safe space because people are going to be worried, uh, uh, you know, AI is going to take our job or not. If you actually invest in uh, learning for your team, you're sending a different message. You're saying we're going to invest in you and you're part of our future. Uh, and we're going to make sure you have these latest technologies in your skill set. The good thing is people are genuinely excited to learn AI. Like a lot of people report yeah. We want to learn AI, which is different than other things. Like people are not that excited to learn uh, many, many things, as you know. <laughs> but, but AI is an exciting one, so that's that's. Yeah, it is. I will say the enthusiasm around it, the enthusiasm around it, and I think again there is at least from a societal change recognition that this is, like it or not, going to be extremely disruptive, and it's either gonna you either get to participate in the change or it's going to happen to you. So whether it's necessarily always a positive excitement, there is an energy behind it that I think does add to, you know, the people's willingness to at least say, I, I want to learn more about it. Yeah. And they see the concrete application on their, you know, their job as well. And I, I think that's important. Another pitfall maybe I mentioned is companies usually look to start with an AI project that is high stake. So okay. they they look for, hey, what is the thing that will completely change our, our, our company and that we need to get right? <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that's problematic because those things are usually hard and they may take years before you start seeing any return. So in, 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 um, uh, uh, on the other hand, I, I recommend starting with not a, you know, a, a low stake, high visibility project. So okay. I'll give you an example. Uh, Andrew Wang, when he was uh, uh, at uh, Google Brain, he's uh, the founding lead of Google Brain. One of the projects that they worked on was uh, recognizing cats in YouTube videos. And I don't know if you remember that project where it came yeah, out in the early 2010s that Google had found billions of cats in on YouTube automatically. Yeah. And so the, the thing is, it's not a high stake application because if you don't find a right, cat, if it doesn't work, you're gonna die. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's gonna die if you don't find a cat. But it is high visibility because people love cats. And on top of that, this was actually one of the projects that accelerated the adoption of neural networks across many other projects at Google's. Um, okay. And because people knew it was neural networks that found those cats, but they, you know, they, the project was low stake enough to move past, have limited roadblocks, and then have a, a significant contribution to the transformation of the company. 
What I love about that last one, you're actually one of the first people I've heard. So I've heard people talk about, you know, don't go for the big kahuna right out of the gate. And I think there's some just traditional wisdom in that, you know, bet all your chips on the roulette wheel. Just, it's not a good idea. Chances are it's going to blow up and your the odds are not in your favor. But what I like about what you added to that, that is actually really unique is you talked about the adjacent uniqueness of that. So finding cats is highly visible, going to get you a lot of attention, low risk, but actually has tons and tons of implications once you prove it out. Because again, anybody in that space would know, well, this image recognition has massive implications, but let's not do it on image recognition that is potentially going to get us into regulatory waters, or we're going to end up caught in all sorts of red tape and bureaucracy type of a thing. Nobody's going to stop a project that says, hey, we're trying to find out if we can pick out cats in YouTube videos. People go, yeah, fine, whatever, go ahead, go for it. But behind the scenes, you know, if we can crack this, we can then translate this to massive other things. And I actually think that's really sage advice to people who are trying to figure this out is think about the problem you're trying to solve and then find an adjacent lower risk version of that problem that you can go, we can tackle this. And if we fail, we fail and nobody gets hurt in the process. But if we win, it doesn't take us much to shift that from this to this. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. I, well, and I also like that you hit on some of the other pieces that I think are just really important to thinking about the fact that, you know, there are a lot of challenges just when it comes to the human side of this and, you know, the trust in the organization. I mean, the number of people I know who some of their hesitation about AI is just, am I training my replacement? And in some ways it's like, well, yes, you are, but it's your replacement so that you can move on to do something else. I think back to like leadership skills where you go, well, you kind of want to train your replacement so you can get a promotion and move on to another job. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing unless you're viewing it as where I am today is where I, the only place I ever want to be. And so I'm, t I'm just going to try and guard that domain. Yeah. Okay. Um, Last, last kind of point on some of these things, you know, as you think about agents and for folks who maybe we can do a little bit of an explanation on what AI agents are, because I'm seeing a really rising boom in agents. Uh, Microsoft just came out on them. Google has done stuff with this and I, I see them kind of rising with this. So one, when you describe to people what AI agents are for people who may not be as familiar with this, where what are they? And then how do you see those starting to play a role? Because to me, I see them becoming really integrated into our work. Yeah. Um, so the way I would explain how I think about an agent is um, first, when you go um, to chat GPT and you ask a question and you get an answer, uh, that is a single turn that you're going through. So you're asking something, you're getting something out. What agents now are doing is that they are able to make a sequence of sound decisions that will take them to an outcome that you have defined for it. So, you know, instead of asking a question and getting an answer, you may set a goal for the agent. The popular ones are in gaming. You would ask it to win a chess game. And it turns out that to win a chess game, you need to be highly nimble and make a sequence of decisions that lead you to win. Well, that's what agents are good at. And so the first type of agents that really were popularized by DeepMind and the likes that were working on a technological reinforcement learning were the ones that were making these long-term decisions and planning so that they can get to the outcome you want. Uh, now, if you look at most agents that are built by the startup community today, they're already pretty good at making decisions in five steps, maybe sometimes even more. Uh, yeah. But when you think about AGI, you, you're probably thinking of an agent that can optimize. Yeah, fully autonomous really AI time. bot that's that can yeah, do everything. That's probably one of the things that, that people are going to be working on. So that's for agent. Now, how is it going to change our world? Well, I, I, I feel like... Uh, we are all going to dedicate, delegate a certain set of tasks to agents in the future. Um, in our space specifically, 
uh, we're looking at how can we help managers become better talent managers? Because most of the time, if you are a manager, you were promoted based on your subject matter expertise. You were really good at something, supply chain or finance, or you knew really well how to work with a spreadsheet and you were promoted because you were better than the, than other people and you could teach them and coach them on earning those uh, skills. But you were not promoted most of the time because you were good at developing talent, at recruiting talent, at analyzing the potential of someone and setting them on the right path. And so the opportunity here for managers is to have a set of agents that are expert at these things, an agent that can help you verify the skills of your people just as good as a psychometrician would do it. So the science okay. of measurement, an agent that can help you recruit folks, an agent that can help you be a learning scientist. And that is how a manager can become a better talent manager. Now, this same analogy can be applied to many other fields where you will find yourself having access to agents that can take some of your daily tasks and that can allow you to uh, focus on, you know, higher order work, if you will. Yeah. Okay. okay. And where are they, are you seeing with these in particular? And I feel like we're still in the, maybe in the startup world, it's a little bit different. I think in bigger organizations, it's a little slower on this. Where are you seeing this in terms of adoption and maturity along the lines of like, agents actually playing an active role in people's work? I think most company, most enterprises I work with are in the process of redefining work. So they're, they're still at the strategy level where they're, they're still wondering how is this affecting our workforce? Like, okay. do we, do we change our organizational design? What are the types of organizational behaviors that we're going to put in place or invest in? Like that's the level that things are happening right now. But I'd say give it a year, the technology will become better. People will have more time to grasp the potential of that technology and then execution um, against uh, 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 implementation of agents, redesign of how uh, the, the organization works uh, optimally is going to happen in a year from now, I imagine. Okay. All right. Well, it'll be interesting to kind of reflect back and see where things are at 12 months from now. Because I think to your point, to me, as I've studied what agents can do and their capabilities, they're extremely, I mean, again, some of the things where people go, oh, AI can never do that. I'm like, yeah, it can. I mean, it's actually pretty good at it. But I think it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, where there's still a lot of um, misunderstandings and just a lack of visibility into what work really happens and how does that work get done and what makes work happen. And we would define that as good work versus when this happens, it's not good work so that you can then define like where does an agent make sense to yeah. play in so that it actually is contributing to things. And I think some companies are jumping in head first and are learning some hard lessons along the way, but I think it'll be interesting to see 12 months from now. I mean, I don't think we're that far off from everyone being comfortable and used to the fact that they're just interacting with AI agents on a regular basis. And I think what Google's doing with gems to make it almost seem like an employee that you're, you know, including in your meetings or, you know, including in your text threads type of a thing, your messenger threads that you can then ask, Hey, can you pull up the meeting notes for this? Or can you send out an update on the status report for this kind of thing? I think that's going to become much more mainstream here in the next 12 to 18 months. But I think for people who are paranoid that you're going to lose your job to an AI agent next week, we're probably not there at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I talked about the the number of the sequence, how long is the sequence of decision that an agent can do? Um, that's one area that we will need to improve on. But even when, as you were speaking about making an agent, uh, like a, almost an analogy of a human that can take care of certain tasks, like we've seen Devin, the software engineer, right? Is it is it useful today? Probably not because the level of accuracy that it gets to is not yet passing the threshold where a software engineer will be comfortable delegating a fully task. Is it interesting though? Certainly. Like the fact that you can see how the agent is thinking because it's communicating through logs to you. Sometimes it's publishing what it's finding. Sometimes it's giving you the bug that it found. Like all of that is interesting. And as we're going to get better, we're going to understand what is the thought process that this agent is going through? And even the thought process will be helpful before the outcome is helpful. And so I, I think adoption will, will be happening even faster than uh, the outcome reaching a certain level of accuracy. 
Yeah, I, I agree that I think what's going to happen is we're kind of getting this slow start because we're working through some of the messiness of it right now. And so we're kind of slogging through the marsh. But once it gets rolling, I think we're going to see an exponential rise in some of this stuff, which is going to be you know disruptive, as is any sort of innovation, which I think is the part that everybody's a little bit uncomfortable with. But it's my hope that this conversation has at least brought some additional visibility to people into how this is all working, what it actually looks like, what are some of the steps you can take to mitigate not only yourself, but your organization, your teams. Because I think, you know, for me, when I look at this, some of the fear mongering going on, I just don't think it's helpful. I, I very much see a path forward through a lot of this. It's just going to take some work and effort and change. And I think that's just part of life. Awesome. Well, Ken, I have really enjoyed our conversation as I always do. So thank you so much for making the time today. Thanks everybody for watching and listening in. And uh, again, keep your eyes open for the Substack that'll drop later this week with some of my biggest reflections. I actually was taking some mental notes on what those are. Um, so thank you, Kian, for joining me. Thank you. Always a pleasure. All right. Have a great one, everybody. And we will see you on the other side.